Shanna from The Binding Blade is very interesting. She used to be valued very lowly, and I thought that was wrong, and with the help of some people smarter than me, created a video explaining why she's actually pretty good. But recently, I had an interesting discussion on Reddit with some people who thought of her as trash, and that discussion still lives rent-free in my head. So today, I want to revisit Shanna the unit. Or rather, Shanna the units, plural, because she really is two different units in one. Because I wanted this video to be more than just theoretical number crunching, I revisited the Binding Blade on hard mode and tried to train Shanna without overly favoring her. I sped the footage up for this video, but I'll put the full playthrough up on my second channel if it doesn't fit in this one, if you want to look at it more closely. I wouldn't call this an efficient playthrough by any means, I just tried to play safely as if I was doing an Iron Man without actually doing an Iron Man. I tried to get all the side objectives, that wouldn't require massive slowdowns, and basically I was just trying to play how a casual hard mode playthrough would go for most people who have played FE6 before. So why did and do people think Shanna is bad in the first place? It's mostly because during the character creation, Shanna put all of her points into three stats, speed, luck, and mobility. Every other stat of hers is either bad or below average at best, both in terms of basis and growth. Most people are willing to put up with a Pegasus Knight that has low bases, whether it's because they enjoy the process of training a weak unit into a strong one, or because they think her flying utility is good, or just because they like them as characters. But even among Pegasus Knights, I think Shanna stands out in just how bad it feels to use her in combat, and that hurts her appeal even in the eyes of those who would train any of those other Pegasus Knights. Now I was aware of all this when I made my pitfalls video on Shanna uh, and trying to show how underrated she was. So let's recap the proposition I made there. I showed how while her base combat isn't great, it's not that much worse than someone like Lance. For example, I compared their strength and damage output, pointing out that Shanna's speed advantage is strictly better than Lance's advantage in constitution. I also pointed out that Shanna's mobility makes it easier for her to fight from places other units can't reach as easily, and that her base defense of 6 is actually decent. All these things are true, and I stand by them individually, but I do think I overlooked some things that I'll get into in a minute once I'm done recapping. Now from here, the plan is to train Shanna to at least level 10 over the course of the early game, until you get the Elysian Whip at the end of Chapter 8. In my playthrough, for that video, I managed to get her there comfortably, and while more levels than just getting to 10 are nice, they aren't necessary. And once Shanna promotes, she gets a big bonus to all of her stats, most notably plus 6 HP, plus 1 movement, and swords. And now, Shanna is actually pretty good at fighting and staying alive against the many axe enemies for the next few chapters. Her strength is still very low, but the idea is that one running enemies is rare for most units anyway, so she can still combine for kills with other units for the rest of the game. And once you get killer weapons in the chapter 13 armory, she can at least fish for critical hits. As the game goes on, she definitely falls off a fair bit, but there's almost always something to do for an 8-move flyer. That is the first Shanna video I made in a nutshell. Put up with her subpar but usable bases for the first 8 maps or so, then reap the rewards for the next 4 maps, like the Dread Isle arc, before switching mostly to flyer utility with the occasional combat roll. And now someone on Reddit was calling my idea of training Shanna a PSYOP, which, if nothing else, is just really funny. And just to make this absolutely clear, I have no issues whatsoever with the two people I discussed this with, I just thought it was a really hilarious way to phrase it. That's all. But I wondered if my old video overlooked some things, and I wanted to re-experience just how bad it really was. Arguing numbers on the internet is my jam, but... The vague saga really taught me how fun it was to try things out in practice. And there are a couple of things, a couple of problems I ran into with Shanna that I think my initial video didn't highlight enough. See if you can spot them in the footage. So one of the arguments I make in the video is that while Shanna has issues one rounding due to her bad strength, one rounding in FE6 is relatively rare and so it's fine to have to combine for kills. I think that's true still, but what I didn't highlight enough is that there's not one rounding and there's not one rounding. There's a difference between doing 80% of an enemy's HP and damage and only doing like 20%. And Shanna is usually closer to the latter, so she cannot always pick off enemies even after someone else hits them. Sometimes even Marcus doesn't set her up for a kill. Later on in the campaign, when Shanna and everyone else is promoted, this problem mostly goes away, 
but in the early game, you see Shanna doing such low damage that it does limit what kills she can and cannot get. Now, to an extent, everyone has to deal with this problem. The Christmas calves, for example, are a little stronger than Shanna, but they too have some pretty sad damage and hit numbers to deal with sometimes, especially if you don't support grind. But the difference is that usually Shanna only has one shot at an enemy, and if you blow it, you have to jump through more hoops to make sure that the enemy dies, or at least you need to protect Shanna from dying. Whereas for the Cavaliers, if they're sitting on terrain with Weapon Triangle or something, they're usually fine. They don't get wrecked by almost any combination of two attacks, and they don't face terribly effective damage from archers. If the Cavs miss, it still kind of sucks, but they can usually manage. It also helps that they can use swords, which are more accurate and give them better survivability against Axe Fighters, which, especially in Chapter 2 and 5, is a big boon for them. That said, Shanna doesn't have to be fed a kill every turn, it's not even close. In my original Pitfalls video, I assumed Shanna was making it to level 12 or so before promoting, but that isn't necessary. Shanna promoted at level 10 can still be very useful in the Dread Isles and afterwards, so while a couple of extra levels are nice, they're not necessary to get the biggest return out of her. That means that Shanna only needs to get 9 levels in chapters 2 through 8. That is 7 chapters, requiring a little over a level in each. Shanna will usually get around 30 experience per kill, so that comes down to 4 kills per map. In reality, I felt like there were some maps where Shanna could get a lot of kills, and some where she would maybe get one or none at all. If there are a lot of axe or bow users, like in chapters 2 and 5, then getting kills is risky. But if you're seeing mostly soldiers, mages, or mercenaries, like in chapters 3, 6, and 8, then it's a lot easier to feed her more kills. In this playthrough, Shanna makes it to level 8 near the end of chapter 6. Even if we assume early chapter 7 is too hectic to get any experience on her, there's still one and a half gigantic map to get the remaining two levels. If this was FE7 with its tiny maps, then I would be skeptical, but FE6 maps get so big and dense so quickly that I think this is very easy to accomplish, even with Shanna's lackluster bulk and strength. Speaking of lackluster strength, this Shanna did not have lackluster strength. That was her second strength level up in two chapters, and that can happen, but it's unlikely. So what I did is starting next chapter, chapter 4, I modified her strength to be one above base instead. Now, so far we've talked a lot about Shanna's combat, but her selling point is of course her flight. The two Shanna dislikers I talked to on Reddit had a seemingly low opinion of her wings, saying it had almost no use whatsoever in the early game. And I think that's incorrect. There are maps where it doesn't do much for you, but there's also a couple moments where I think it's really nice. In Chapter 2, I'll admit it doesn't do much of anything. You can use Shanna to get the Armor Slayer from the village over the mountains to the boss, but it's also pretty easy to trade chain it and it would only be a little slower. And since I'm not necessarily analyzing this from like an LTC standpoint, I don't think it's very convincing. So forget Chapter 2 for a moment. Chapter 3, it doesn't matter, it's still a good map to feed Shanna, but her flight is useless. Chapter 4, I think it's very useful, because it lets you airdrop a unit you don't need for combat onto the southern fort to stop a pirate from spawning. You can have Shanna block the other reinforcements, or you can just let it spawn and fight that first unit. Either way, you no longer have to fight the pirates on the beach, and you can focus all of your attention on the cavaliers. In the footage, I screwed up the drop, because one of the spawn points was at a different spot than I thought it was, and I should have looked it up right before I did it, but it still turned out fine. And after you've done that, you can have Shanna grab the Angelic Grove from the bottom village, maybe visit the shops, and as long as the pirates are blocked, you can usually regroup with the main squad safely. But again, you could just spend a couple of extra turns grabbing the Robe village, as long as it doesn't get you in trouble with the cavalry reinforcements from the back. Chapter 5 has a lot of terrain, but seemingly not a lot of great ways to use Shanna. You can try going through the left door to rush the gate, but that is so difficult to do without a pre-planned strategy, since you spawn a bunch of extra enemies doing so. You have to deal with brigands getting up to peaks, throwing hand axes at you, you have to fight more of these fast nomads. It's really annoying, so in my experience, most people go through the top area, the long way around. I've seen some people bring up that Shanna can get the village, but like, it's not under any threat, you can get it whenever your 20 million force deploy units feel like it, so I don't think it counts. What I did in my playthrough, I think, is way more useful. You drop a good unit, like Marcus or Rutger, a little ahead of schedule, and they occupy a group of fighters making their way to you. 
This avoids a giant traffic jam near the first set of forts, and it lets you take care of those enemies first, and then let the next group come to you. I found this way more comfortable than the usual approach, and I recommend it to everyone, and I'm gonna start doing it in my playthroughs from now on. Chapter 6 is a lot like Chapter 3, it's another train chapter for Shanna with no flight utility. However, I will also say that while it is easier to feed her one soldier than it is to feed her one fighter, when these soldiers are clogged up, like they are here in Chapter 6, it's still fairly difficult to get her more than one kill per turn, especially since her lower strength means that she often has to take counterattacks as she needs to double in order to kill, or double in order to safeguard against missing, so that's just a side note. In Chapter 7, I like that Shanna can help with the rescue drop on Roy to get him in range of Jared. I'm sure you can do it without her, but it's nice that she ignores the force near the starting point, and she can use the less desirable deployment slots for herself while other units can get the better ones. Is what I would say if I stuck to my original script, but you can see in the footage that instead I used Shanna to trade Marcus's items around and then use two other units to drop Roy, but she can do that too. It also works nicely with my turn 1 plan that sends the Christmas calf to the left to hold the choke point left of the arena. If you haven't seen this plan before, I have a whole video on Chapter 7 that explains the best opening uh, for the first couple of turns. Uh, that really makes the chapter a lot easier in my experience. In Chapter 8, there is once again no terrain. It's an indoor map, except there's a couple pillars. I do think that even though Shanna's flight doesn't matter in these maps, her 7 move, Kanto, and the ability to rescue drop absolutely does. Being able to reposition player units after they've moved is just super useful in all the maps Shanna is in, but especially this one because there's so much terrain to cover, or so much ground to cover, I should say. We do already have several other units that can do that, like Marcus, Clarine, and the Christmas Cavaliers, but freeing up one of their turns in exchange for Shanna's is a good deal, and in outdoor maps, Shanna is the best at this. Alright, so once we get to the end of Chapter 8, there will be two types of people. Those who have trained Shanna and want to promote her now, and those who didn't train Shanna. And the big central question to this video is who is better off? Is the early game investment of feeding Shanna and keeping her safe worth the payoff of one move extra, swords, and just better mid-game combat? Or is it better to keep Shanna untrained and use her seven move wings instead when required? For the record, I'm not 100% sure which of these two options is the better or the recommended or the easier way. What I can tell you is the fact that an unpromoted, untrained Shanna still has some utility in the mid-game makes her better, not worse. Until Thea joins, she is still your only flyer, and she can still provide useful rescue drop utility. In Chapter 8x, you have this gap in the middle that you can drop units over. It doesn't just save you turns, but also tedium, and this time you can instead spend with your loved ones instead of watching lava pillars. In Chapter 9, there is this one tile wide gap you can drop Rutger over to give him a head start in the map. And in the Rut split portions, there is a fair bit of terrain that you can have Shanna help with as well. The main one I want to point out is her ability to drop, again, Rutger over the city wall in Chapter 11a. That way you can fight the enemies near the villages quicker and it makes it easier to beat the brigands to visiting them. Now I'm not gonna lie, Shanna peaks during the Dread Isle arc. After most Axe users disappear, her combat gets relatively worse, and she no longer has a monopoly on flying. First of all, Thea joins. I've done elaborate comparisons between Thea and Shanna in the past, and I've always found Thea pretty mid. But in hard mode, she does have the same strength at her base level of 8 as Shanna can be expected to have at this point. That's not good, you know, but it says something. Thea only needs two levels to get to become Shanna 2.0 with worse speed and luck, but slightly better strength and bulk. The two levels that Thea needs sound like a lot less than the nine that Shanna needs, and numerically that's true, but Thea needs to get them in a much more hostile environment. While Shanna's deployment was free, or practically free in the early game, Thea is competing with a lot more units for a slot, and usually most of them will be better than her, at least while she's still training. And Thea will never have the Dread Isle payoff that Shanna did, so I think Thea is not only worse than Shanna, but pretty mid in general. The bigger competition is, of course, Milady, because she has both the best mobility and arguably the best combat in the game. But I think class by class, or in this case, flyer by flyer comparisons, are a pitfall. Milady does better than everyone else, including Shanna, but does Milady actually devalue Shanna? Does her existing make Shanna worse? Or does Thea, for that matter? I see flying utility as similar to thief utility. The more unique it is, the more valuable it is, because there are less alternatives. Basically, the laws of supply and demand. 
All these flyer only tricks I've shown were Shanna only, but for any of those tricks in future maps, she has to share the credit with these other flyers. So in that sense, yes, I do think Milady and Thea being there devalues Shanna. That said, I still think there's a lot of value in having multiple flyers in a lot of maps. The big one is chapter 14, the desert chapter, where there's always going to be demand for a flying unit to transport other people around on any given turn. You don't necessarily want Milady to be doing that when she could spend her turn using stat boosters, fighting enemies, or healing herself. But even in other maps, it's just nice to have access to a 8 move flyer, even if it's not essential. Shanna can still do a lot of these duties with 7 move and no training, of course, or you can replace her with base level Thea or Zeus. But their flexibility will be significantly hindered. 7 and 8 move don't seem that different on paper, but they just add up on these big maps, especially on units with Kanto. And in Shanna's case, having her trained to survive an extra hit can also let her do a lot more. After chapter 16, you also have Zeus. He's probably the easiest unpromoted flyer to get to level 10. I think he's way less painful to train than both Shanna and Thea. From there on out, I think the only map where she really stands out is chapter 21, where you can use your flyers to transport people over the mountains to avoid reinforcement zones. And you also might have Yuno for that. Honestly, a trains Shanna's biggest contribution after chapter 16, in my opinion, is the next five maps you play. You either go to Ilya or Sake, depending on whether you gave more experience to your Pegasus Knights or your Nomads. Ilya is usually considered easier than Sake, so that's where we want to go. A uh, fun little side tangent, in the past when Shanna was considered bad, the assumption in unit debates was usually that the player went to Sake because the Nomads were better than the Pegasus Knights, and also the Wyverns were better than the Pegasus Knights. And sure, the Arc will be R, but putting up with five worse maps over it just seems painful. Nowadays, most people want to go to Ilya, which generally means you can't afford to use Shin. And that sucks, because Shin is really good. He's got a great combination of strength and speed, he's very mobile, and bows are a nice weapon type to have in FE6. Training Shanna allows you to use Shin almost as much as you want. Now, does Shanna deserve credit for taking you to Ilya over Sakai? I think that's a little dubious, but arguable at the very least. But I do think it's a good argument for training Shanna over not training Shanna. Speaking of which, let's wrap this up. Throughout this video, I've tried to juggle two different questions about Shanna at the same time. Is she good? And is she worth training? Is the trained or the untrained version of Shanna better? These two questions have a fair bit of overlap, but it's possible to find Shanna very useful while also thinking she should not be trained. A lot of the things that Shanna can do require zero investment into her, other than maybe a deployment slot when there's little competition. I think everyone would agree that the couple of things Shanna can do as a flyer that no one else can do are moderately useful at least, and the main disagreement is on exactly how valuable it all is. The bigger point of contention is whether you also want to spend time training her. Back when I made Pitfall 6, I was absolutely sure it was worth. Now. I'm less sure. It's not that there's not enough experience for her, I don't think she takes away a significant amount of XP from the Christmas Cavs or Rutger, but it's not zero cost, it takes some dedication to get her those kills. I do still like the payoff of promoted Shanna, especially for chapters 8x through 11 or so, and it's still nice afterwards, especially in the desert, but it feels like her relative value drops with every map after that, with a slight uptick in chapter 21. Of course, it goes without saying that Shanna is never needed for any map, and you're not going to hear me say that she is. Without thinking too hard on it, currently I would put Shanna roughly here in a B tier on a hard mode tier list, equivalent to Deke, who is pretty good, but not like super great at fighting for most of the game. Like, Deke is fine, but he doesn't add a whole lot to a team of competent combat units. On the other hand, I know that some people would rank her higher. Someone whose opinion I generally respect told me they would put her above Rutger, though that's also partially because they just don't think Rutger is that great. On the other hand, the person I talked to on Reddit ranked her below the more mediocre grounded combat units like Lot and Lou, and I just don't agree with that. So that's where I'm asking you. Where do you stand on Shanna now? Do you think she's a bad unit period? Or do you think she's good? Do you train her? Or do you not train her? Let me know.